And, you know, $1,000 a week that's good money. times four weeks times 52 weeks, that's $52,000. Yeah. That's a starting salary at a, at a nice consulting job. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hey, I'm all the way to the good. What I learned very quickly about projections is that we often believe that the market will be more receptive to our offering than in reality it is. Oh, what's up everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean. And today I got a special guest for you guys, none other than Ryan Leslie. Now, we talk about things from his early beginnings all the way into hacking his way into Harvard at 15 years old and at one point living in the basement to him breaking into the music industry, tricking P. Diddy into thinking his song was a hit before it really was a hit. And of course, his app Superphone, which has been used by so many artists from Cardi B, Rory, and a lot of other artists you wouldn't even expect. And then we end with Ryan Leslie telling you how to text them because it wouldn't be Ryan Leslie if he didn't. Now, let's hop into it. Is I know it couldn't have always been that easy, right? So you see smart guy, this guy went to Harvard. You see, he's been through the industry and he now he's in this tech thing, he keeps winning. How did it start off? Started off, seriously, my parents. My okay. parents are musicians. So oh, God, I didn't my know that. dad actually started a band so that he could get my mom to come rehearse for him oh. and with him. And I mean, I believe that when you're talking about relationships, relationships uh. are really built on two main elements. One is frequency of contact and okay. two is proximity. Uh. So even before I had Superphone, my father already had figured this out with my mom and he said, look, <laughs> we need to be in contact. Yeah, I need to figure out a system or a structure in which we'll be in contact frequently okay. and we'll be close together. We spend a lot of time. So we started a band and made her the lead singer. And wow. so you probably he, had a game. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he figured it out. Group. Yeah, he figured it out. <laughs> and I think honestly, they were, they being in the Salvation Army, they're also administrators and officers in the Salvation Army. Being in the Salvation Army, they wanted myself and my sister to have a different life path. Mm. And not that they weren't, advocates of a service career mm -hmm. they just knew that for, for generating wealth right yes you can be in the service business the nonprofit service business is antithetical to generating wealth uh, per se okay. so which is why you find a lot of folks they make a lot of money and then they become philanthropists afterwards and so got it, got even it. though the salvation army generates i think four billion dollars a year in donations of revenue, the 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 thesis and the spirit of the Salvation Army is sacrifice yourself in the service of others. Uh, so every Christmas, okay. every Thanksgiving, yeah. before we even ate, we always served the community. So yeah, I mean, that means that I basically grew up eating government cheese <laughs> and having the same meals that that were provided to the people that the Salvation Army served. Yeah. And we made it happen. You know, my parents actually, you know, I think you're right. A lot of folks don't actually know the backstory. Right. My parents made it happen, raised a family of four on the equivalent of, you know, about $800 a month. And so Jeez. for folks that are out there struggling and folks that are out there that are counting their money and, and penny pension, I know what it means to make ends meet with a very, very limited budget. Yeah. And so my father wanted a different life for me. And so he believed, as many parents did, that education was gonna be the way to get us there. Right. Okay. And when I say us, I'm talking about myself and my sister. So my sister has a, has her master's degree. She went to UC Berkeley. Okay. Myself applied very early to Harvard, got in, finished. At and 15, by the way. Yeah, yeah, how yeah, the, yeah. How the hell yeah. does a 15 year old get, get into Harvard? Listen, anything is possible. Yeah. Any any goal is possible as long as you set your mind to it. And I think my father had a, had a really, really specific compass and direction for me. And so anytime I come to him, oh, I'm done with my homework, he would say, well, I got this SAT practice test you could do. Oh, and one okay. of the, well, I guess in reading and researching the SATs, he realized that standardized tests are mostly a function of how familiar you are with the test as opposed to how smart you are. And so the more <laughs> practice tests you take, the more familiar you are with the, the actual test. Right. And what they found is that folks that are more familiar with the 
kinds of questions perform better on standardized tests. And so I took a lot of practice tests. I scored very well and uh, yeah, got into Harvard so, very early. Yeah. And my parents were kind of devastated when I told them I wanted to do music. And I, I looked at them and I said, well, you know, I was born out of music. You, Your romance was kindled <laughs> on the foundation of this musical <laughs> chemistry. And uh, they said, well, you know, music is a hobby, man. You know, music, mm. it, it, it came really easy for us as as parents. My mother's a classically classically trained pianist. And so they, you know, especially in the Caribbean island, everybody does music. They play whatever. They play <laughs> brass yeah. instruments, et cetera. So uh -huh. they really looked at it as a hobby. And I think also most parents, if you're listening now and, and you have this idea that, you know, people don't understand your dream of, of wanting to do music or be an entrepreneur or create, most parents, they just have a, an innate uh, instinct to protect you mm. from the personal risk of trying to do yeah. a career that's highly competitive. And music, as you know, I mean, you, you talk about this on your show all the time, the independent grind, deciding to do music, is very very it, it's a challenge and yeah. it, it's a challenge that you know it takes a certain mentality to, to want to be able to do that kind of work so speaking of that mentality then like how do you take graduating from harvard like everybody's already looking at you as like some kind of enigma or they're, <laughs> they're praising you at that moment right you're young and you graduated from a school like this and mm -hmm. you're going the complete opposite direction most of yeah. those guys consultants lawyers things yes. like that how do you kind of take up the the gravitas to actually say no i'm going to go this completely different path like that's that's big for anybody but you're only 19 at that age yeah listen i i believe that you should when you're young mm -hmm. take the biggest risks take the biggest risk when you're young did you think like that while you were young though well i gave the harvard oration when i when i graduated so the way that works is harvard at the time and i don't know if it's changed since there is no valedictorian at Harvard. So if you want to give the speech, the Harvard oration, where you actually speak to your classmates, you just have to compete and win a speech competition. Whoever has the best speech wins. And so I wrote this speech and my speech was really about doing what you believe in, believing in what you do, and really was, was written specifically to, I mean, almost coach myself mm. and coax myself to overcome the apprehension that I had about striking out on my own and saying I wanted to do music versus the more traditional pathway gotcha. that education would have taken me. So what was the first step then? Once you are, you graduated, now you're out here. You haven't been spending time really training for this field. Had you been building connections? What was the first thing you did man, to get in the industry? Man, I really, <laughs> I think looking back, I really thought that the music business, because my favorite artists were multi-instrumentalists. Okay. So Prince and Stevie Wonder. <laughs> okay, yeah. And also, when you think about the songwriting prowess of Michael Jackson, I, I believe that, and and just the dancing talent and mm -hmm. the and and the vocals of Michael Jackson, yeah. I just believe that music was a meritocracy. Yeah. So what I meant, We're just what I mean, just yeah. to slow that down for people yeah. who don't understand meritocracy. Yeah, that's just basically saying that it's all about talent. Yes, and <laughs> the and, best wins. Yeah, and you're and, saying it's not that. Yeah, well, that's what I believed. And so you asked me what my what my steps were, and my yeah. steps were become the greatest music producer that I could possibly be mm. without a teacher. Okay. So, and this was even pre, I mean, right now, I mean, if you think about when, how I started and how I started to communicate my art to the world, it really started to take off when YouTube began. Right, and right. when YouTube began, I was able to actually film my studio sessions and put them online. So when I was coming up, these are the kinds of videos I wish I could have seen. Right. I was learning how to produce music by just listening to my favorite producers, Timbaland, Jermaine Dupri, my favorite records, Usher records, etc. And these are guys that were the same age as me and were already killing in the music industry. Like mm -hmm. Usher, Usher and I are the same age. And so seeing somebody like that and listening to the sound that Jermaine Dupri had crafted for him was really, to me, very, very inspirational. And I wanted to be able to emulate that sound. And so I really believe that, listen, if you were good enough to make that sound, you would just make it. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was for me, the, 
the the guiding principle in my mind and that really i had to i had to learn some hard lessons about just being great as a mm. musician you know it's it's when you're just great as a musician when that is disconnected from networking like your first question was hey how are you already networking having connections yeah i believe that th there's now a more prevalent understanding that in order to be successful you need to really be intentional about your relationships and yeah. your relationship building back then as a, as a as a you know late teen early 20 year old i really truly believed that it was just all about skill and talent yeah. and that someone would just plug me out of obscurity and give me a chance and it, mm. would, it would work that way. Man, so how did you, um, I guess how'd you say you would learn that lesson and who was that person who really did finally bring you in or did you just wake up one day and say, all right, I need to go, this isn't working, I gotta do something else? Yeah, I, uh, I, made a, I made a very crude business plan and the crude business plan was, I was gonna sell beats for $200 a pop and the projection that I had was I could sell five beats a week, mm -hmm. which would make me a thousand dollars a week. And back then, I mean, we talk about you know <laughs> late nineties, early two thousands. So man, you know a thousand dollars a week good money. times four weeks times fifty two weeks. That's fifty two thousand dollars. That's a starting salary at a at a nice consulting job. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hey, I'm all the way to the good. What I learned very quickly about projections is that we often believe that the market will be more receptive to our offering than in reality it is. Mm. And so I really was more selling a couple beats per month and the economics were upside down and I found myself just hanging out on my dad's couch. I mean, first of all, I was moonlighting in the Harvard dorms after I graduated, you know, because my key card still worked and I was living <laughs> basically in illegally in the basement of, of one of the Harvard dorms and using the studio and sneaking upstairs to use the showers and still have my Man. key card for the laundry, just trying to figure it out. And I believed that it was gonna happen. And so now thinking back, uh, I won a competition with, with one of my good friends from Berkeley College of Music. His name is Latif, Corey Latif. He got signed to Motown and really, it was directly correlated to relationships. Mm. So that competition got us in front of a bunch of record executives at the Apollo Theater. Corey performed, killed the performance, and there were a lot of interested parties. And had I known then what I know now, I think that the trajectory would have been greatly accelerated. Mm. And I wouldn't change anything at all because I believe that that pathway was, was, was requisite for me to actually have the knowledge and the learnings that I have now and the ability to actually productize it now so that a whole nother generation of musicians and entrepreneurs can learn from my story and actually accelerate their success, reduce the, the dependency on luck in their success trajectory. And I believe in that. I believe that you can create your own luck as long as you're intentional about the relationships. And so I think that is great mm. in this interview that your first question in terms of how someone achieves success is who are you networking with? Because it is really success, A, happens at the speed of communication and is directly correlated mm. to who you know, and not only who you know, but how well you're communicating with those people. Interesting. So, I mean, I guess that, leans towards why you're basically focusing currently on Superphone, right? Sure. Everything centered for Superphone is relationship, relationship, relationship. Yes. Let's keep in contact with people. Yes. Describe Superphone from your perspective. Yeah. And the mindset that got you into creating it. Yeah, yeah. Initially, Superphone for me was just based on the idea that social connections are weak. I started with YouTube and MySpace and then all of a sudden, when everyone migrated away from MySpace, where were all my friends? Because mm. I had all these MySpace friends. And then I started to build on Facebook. And then Facebook caps you at 5,000 friends. And if you have more than 5,000 friends, you have to get a page. And then, then there was the advent of Twitter and Instagram. And I had all these social connections, more than a million followers across all these platforms. And I felt ridiculously disconnected 
from all of these social connections. Mm. And when you really think about the activity of liking a picture or maybe leaving a comment, the expected response time is really low. So if you left a comment on DJ Khaled or you left a comment for Drake or you liked the Chris Brown picture, do you really expect a response? No. And what I found is that, you know, because my fans didn't expect a response, the actual relationship was very, very weak. And so when I decided, hey, you know, check out my latest video, check out my latest song, check out my latest project, the response, yeah, maybe I got some likes and comments. I felt like I was very, very disconnected with the people that really wanted to be connected. And so I started giving my phone number out because I just wanted, I feel like the phone number is overlooked as one of the greatest, most powerful social handles. And what I mean yeah. by that is once you get someone's number, and I mean, that's why when, you know, when you first start dating, you go out, you know, it's all about, <laughs> yo, I got her number. You, you got to get that number. That's, you know, and, and nowadays, I mean, I, I guess some people will say, yo, you know, let me get your gram. They follow on the gram. But it's it's and they, still not you know, real until you got the number. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Because you're not making phone calls over Instagram. Yeah. So for me, it was really just about I want to be able to have that kind of relationship at scale uh -huh. with all the people that wanted to support me. And I needed to be able to build some automation and, and leverage technology to be able to have that kind of personal one on one touch at scale. And when I say at scale, I mean across thousands and tens of thousands. So today right. in, in, in this phone right now, my conversation feed, I have over 76,000 active conversations with people who have ever texted me. Mm. And if Instagram shuts down tomorrow, if Twitter shuts down tomorrow, if Facebook shuts down tomorrow, I could literally spend the rest of my life just calling every single fan, thanking them. And I could also, if I wanted to, if I wanted to just press a button and send a thank you text to everyone that's ever supported me, because I know the difference between people who bought my album and who haven't. Mm. So... That's where it started. With, with, with that being said, because I think it's a, a very loose idea. It sounds cool for anybody just hearing it from the outside. But kind of walk me through like a, a scenario, because when I first I already had a perception, I was used to CRMs and things yeah. like that. But when you showed me some of the back end, it yeah. blew my mind to a whole <laughs> other level. Um, like yeah. the example of you going, you can see what city they're in. Yes. And then if they were working at Starbucks, things yes. like that. Walk walk. Walk people through what it's like, the Superphone experience is. Yeah. Well, I mean, this interview is is directly correlated to Superphone, right? So I'll say this. I, I check my messages every morning just like anyone else, yeah. you know. And someone, you know, asked me one day, like, hey, Brian, I want to sign up for Superphone. I said, well, well, how'd you hear about it? Well, I heard about it from Brandman Chantel. So I, then I, <laughs> the, the, the beauty of that is that I could just, then just go look up that we had met whether it was A three C or wherever we had met, yeah, we'd yeah. exchange information. I could shoot you a text. I mean, it's yeah. very, very powerful when you have a direct phone number on people because you're you're able to to make that success happen mm -hmm. very accelerated. And so the super phone experience is very simple. People text you. Your phone knows who is already in your phone book mm -hmm. and who's new. For everyone that's new, your phone automatically says, "Hey." Let me get some more info with your name, your email, your city. And then at that point, I can also integrate my e-commerce. So I have, I have mzrt.com where I sell all my experiences and merchandise and everything. And it will tell me how much every single person in my phone has spent. Mm. And I also have, a, have the ability to, to, to apply tags to, to people and to conversations. So I can, if I wanted to right now, I could say, hey, these are the 312 people that are investors that I know. These are the 125 people I know who are photographers and videographers. These are the 60 people I know who are journalists. These are the 85 people I know who are DJs. And as I was doing this for myself, I started to realize that most people just don't have this kind of organization yeah. to the conversations in their life, period. And so I wanted to, and, and, it, and it really ignited a, a passion within me to build a product that was easy to use, that was already taking advantage of acti a daily activity. Probably our most important daily activity is our communication. Yeah, yeah. we have to eat, we have to breathe. You know, <laughs> yeah. we have to. We we, we yeah. use the restroom. We have to sleep. And then, aside from all of those human necessities, our most important daily activity, I believe, is communication. Mm -hmm. And the fact that 
most people's communication is totally disorganized. And it's no fault of our own, but most people's communication is totally disorganized. And also the fact that most people that we meet jump into our phones, we exchange contact information, and then those contacts just fall asleep in our phones was a very, very curious challenge for me because when I sit down and I talk to young people or anyone for that matter that wants to be successful, the number one interchangeable reason for why they feel like they have a barrier to success is either money or they feel like they don't know the right people. Mm. And I fir firmly believe that if you know the right people, you can get to the money. You can get to That's investors there, yeah. or you can get to your customers, you can get to business development, et cetera. So it's really, really 100% about people. And so if you're a young person, you're watching this right now and you're thinking like, okay, why am I watching this? What am I gonna get out of this? The most important gem that I can leave for you is the fact that your relationship with people is going to shape your entire life experience and you should treat every single person that you meet every single person that has the honor of being in your phone you should treat those people with the kind of respect that you would want to be treated as a human being as someone that is valuable to the world and so you know most people i, I i'll sit down with i mean we could run this experiment right now how many contacts do you have in your phone <laughs> let's take a look let's take a look I, I, let's take a look let's, let's take a look we got to check it out uh, so does 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 the Android? I see you got the new S8. Yep. How do you actually tell how many contacts you have? You can just go to your contacts and scroll all the way down. I think. Uh, let me see. Six hundred forty-three. Six hundred forty-three contacts. Yeah. How many of those contacts did you actually talk to today? Today? Yeah. Maybe like three, four. Three or four, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that would mean that one percent of those contacts would be if you talk to six of them. Yeah. So you talk to half of 1% of the people in your phone. The idea behind Superphone is that we found that 80 to 90% of the people that are in your phone, friends, family, loved ones, exes, new romance, whatever it is, investors, mentors, 90% of those people are just sleeping in your phone. And if there was a way for you to wake up those conversations and be able to extract the value of a great collaboration, mm -hmm. even just 10% more of those conversations. 10% of your phone would be 60 people today. If you were having 60 conversations today, that's six, that's, that's 60 chances for you to be invited to something that could enrich your life. Right. Okay. Well, see, I'm thinking from an artist's perspective, right? Sure. And then I think of the almost just social perspective. Sure. From an artist's perspective, especially what you showed me, um on the back end it's like all right so i can go to a city i'm just stopping by sure. let's just say atlanta yeah right i'm on the way to atlanta and then i can look up all of my fan phone my fans in atlanta sure that i have in my phone not only that i could say i want to look up the fans that have spent 50 dollars <laughs> yes with me in the last three months yeah and i can text all those fans and just say, yo, I'm gonna be here this time, let's do a quick meetup, I would love to meet you, yeah, or something like that. Absolutely, and we have, you know, we have folks that do that, you know, so uh, one crazy. of my little homies from Atlanta, his name is Rory, yeah. he does yeah, concerts Rory. in the woods, and he uses, <laughs> yeah. he uses a phone number to actually distribute the location for his concerts, oh, right? Wow. And so it's, a, it's really, I mean, I can't tell you how really simple of a concept yeah. it is, and, it may seem foreign, and I, the reason I know that it seems foreign is because when people think about their cell phone numbers, they really think about it as some personal, sacred, important, guarded treasure in yeah. their life. A, they never want to change their number, and B, they don't want to really give their number out. And also in hip hop, we're always taught like, no new friends, you can't <laughs> yeah, have my yeah, number, yeah. don't speak to me directly, yeah. talk to my manager, talk to my agent. And in many ways, there are there are situations where that's important if you want to be very very focused because like I'm saying your communication has to be intentional so you don't want to have a bunch of folks that are coming into your life and into your conversation thread and ringing your phone that are distracting you from being the successful the most successful best version of yourself you can right. be at the same time though when you got six how did those 634 people even make it into your phone at some point in time in your life, you thought that it was important enough for you guys to, sh to exchange information. Yeah. And so for me, 
when we talk about it in the fan standpoint, it is important for me to exchange information because what I found is that because people follow so many other profiles on social, it's very possible that I could have a concert in Atlanta or DC or LA or San Francisco and people wouldn't hear about it until they see every one of their friends oh, posting yeah, about man. it. You have to wait. I mean, you have this organic reach that's being suppressed. Right. right. There's a lot of, yeah, there's right. a lot of posts that people do not see. Right. right. <laughs> I know right. that from marketing all the right. time. So, I mean, with our one thing when it comes to Superphone, do you know anybody who's used it for more, let's just say, trivial reasons like <laughs> I got all my exes in this list and, yeah. or I got... Or just to keep better contact with, yeah. <laughs> with you know, whoever. Yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah, to... yeah, yeah. So there, there, are, there are so many great use cases yeah. of that. And, I mean, you could think of a, if you're a startup founder. Uh -huh. So let's just say you have, a, you have a great idea. I just came from CES. Uh -huh. And there's so many uh, great companies there, new technologies that are being built. I know for me personally, when I started Superphone, I was very much happy using it as a tool and a secret weapon for myself. Yeah, and it was because of a, of a conversation I had and a, an exchange I had with Tristan Walker, mm -hmm. who is an entrepreneur in residence at a big venture capital right, firm Jason called Horowitz. Jason Horowitz, yeah. right? He sent me a text to say, hey, Ryan, you should meet my friend Ben. And Ben really was the guy that said, hey, you should productize this. And me being a, a, a self-made entrepreneur, someone who always bootstrapped, I didn't even have a single investor in my phone. That's number one. And number two, I didn't Man. even have any idea how I could actually accept money from someone else and be a good steward of their investment. So for me, the utility of Superphone began to pivot at that moment because for the first time now I had a category of people that I could start tracking. Mm -hmm. And so that category of people, and I knew what success meant for me. Success for me, for Superphone at that moment, beyond making the millions of dollars that I had made as an independent artist, now it was, how do I raise millions of dollars from a much, 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 much smaller and more focused group of people? So to get to $2 million in revenue as an independent artist, it took me about 40,000 tickets. 40,000 mm -hmm. tickets was probably bought by about 15 or 20,000 people. Right, because everyone that came to the concert brought a friend, mm -hmm. bought three or four tickets. Yeah, forty thousand tickets at forty euros a ticket is one point six million euros. Add that to the seventeen thousand records. Add that to merch. Add that to experiences coming to the studio. My New Year's Eve party. You're talking about a two million dollar album cycle. No label. No manager. No music videos. No PR. Straight off of the phone. Mm. The difference with raising millions of dollars from a venture standpoint is that. There are very few startups, unless they've crowdfunded their fund, their, their, their investment, that have 40,000 investors. And even for me, having 68 investors on my cap table, a lot of people and, and, and folks will look at me and say, man, that's so many people. Yeah. Because in venture, you want to have the most engaged, focused, directed group of investors because it takes a lot of time to deal with a lot of people. Right. Is that your phone? That's your phone. Yeah. There we go. Super <laughs> phone is going off, I see. <laughs> so, so for me, you're asking about a, a case outside of the music industry. Right. The case for me outside of the music industry was very specifically to find investors. And that was my metric of success. I wanted to find success. I wanted to be successful finding investors. And being successful finding investors has now led me to 312 investors that are tagged in my phone, 68 of which have invested more than $4.7 million Sheesh. into Superphone. Congratulations on that right there, man. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, I want to um, do one pivot really, really quick, quickly because Superphone is intriguing in itself, but just back to the artists, because I know a lot of artists watch this, the hustle that you had when you first started off. Yeah. Like I remember that um, CMP Diddy talk about that he had never seen an artist mm -hmm. really going out, building their own fan base, specifically in Europe, going straight global. Well, what I learned is that a lot of, uh, a lot of international artists would go over to Europe and feel very entitled. They say, mm -hmm. oh, I'm already a big star in the United States. Everyone should treat me like I'm a big star 
Mm. And I was always very, very respectful and thankful and grateful for the appreciation that I would get in different countries. Well, really the appreciation I would get anywhere, but the appreciation I would get in different countries. And I would always make sure that I did every request. I would always make sure that my set length was longer than other American artists that came over so I could differentiate myself. Wow. And maybe kind of for the first time, I started to see that the skill level of being a multi-instrumentalist, being proficient on many different instruments, breaking records down instead of just performing over my tracks. These kinds of elements, I found that people really appreciated. And so I understood first based on data and second based on being in the field and actually being on stage over there and sometimes playing four and a half hour sets Ooh. that people actually cared and appreciated. And man, I mean, the internet is a very, very powerful tool to A, communicate yeah. to large numbers of people. I mean, you can, through one YouTube channel, you're a perfect example, literally have a an international, an internationally accessible global content channel. Right. And it's your responsibility to make sure that content is happening on a consistent basis. And mm -hmm. so for me, starting out in the game, it was every single day for a year, running around New York City, working with Cassie, filming everything on my own, then setting up a camera on a tripod, just like you have here, speaking into the camera, cutting it up. It was called NS for Life. Some of those clips might still be on my YouTube channel. And it was every single day for a year, understanding that fast, furious frequency of consistent content mm -hmm. was gonna be the way that I could not only build, but also retain an audience, right? And exactly. then I can look at the insights. You can look at the insights on YouTube. You can look at the insights on Spotify. Yep. You can look at the insights on Facebook. You can know where your audience is actually developing. And then it's your responsibility to A, be able to communicate with that audience directly and B, play to the geographical locations. Mm where your audience is building. And that's what I that's what I leveraged in the beginning of my career. What's crazy about that is the biggest edge out of all that that you said kind of relates to some of the theme of Superphone, which is just treating people like they're human. Yes. Like you respected them and you tra treated them better than yes. other artists who might yes. have bigger names, yes. more money backing. Yeah. And you just said, I want to treat y'all <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like y'all yeah, are yeah, amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so you had that hack. I mean, you. Um, another story I heard was uh, P. Diddy said, uh, well, you said, I think you paid somebody off wherever he went. Yeah. You, you, you would pay for your song to be played. So, yeah. So for him, I always talk to everybody on the channel about the idea of targeted omnipresence, which sure. is being everywhere to a targeted amount of uh, fans, right? Sure. You did it to one person. Yeah, wherever for sure. This, wherever P. Diddy went, he heard your song. Yes. Because, unknowingly that you were paying somebody yeah. off. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. what gets you like in the mindset of this hustle that you're constantly listen got a lot a, a lot of it's trial and error man yeah. a lot of it's trial and error and also i think so many people talk about trial and error mm -hmm. and very few people talk about trial and success people mm -hmm. always look at trial and success and they monday morning quarterback and they say oh okay well i was successful because x y and z wow. i understand that for every number of trial and errors that you have, there will be also a number of trial and success. Mm -hmm. And to get to success, especially right. in in verticals where you you have to be a trailblazer, mm -hmm. and really in the MySpace days between myself, my 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 uh, my, my my partner and and one of my best friends, Rashid Richmond, we were trailblazers in that MySpace era. How do you take an artist from relative obscurity, a a burgeoning modeling career from New London, Connecticut, and leverage a social platform that was new, but nascent and vibrant and growing, and take that artist, take her dream, make it come true on a platform that was emerging, being a trailblazer, to be 100% truthful and honest, it took a lot of trial and error and there were those moments where we had trial and success. And so, I mean, it was rich, it was rich dollars actually. Rich dollars was, 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 was working on, on, um, on a bad boy street team okay. and bad boy radio team. And man, he was really, you know, I listened as much as I could, you know, being young and having success early, you could definitely have your, your share of, of arrogance. Mm. And there were moments where I just said, look, you know, it's going to be a lot better for me to just listen mm. 
-hmm. And if I listen to someone that's willing to work with me, then I'm going to accelerate faster. And so he was really the guy that had the idea. Man, look, we in the mix show, we in the clubs. And since I'm on the Bad Boy Street team, everywhere Puff is going, I already know where he's going to be. So, Ryan, I just need that budget, you know, and we'll make sure that the DJs <laughs> are spinning it. And gotcha. uh, that's 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 how it, that's how I went down, man. Man, okay. Well, um, I have just two more questions. Sure. One, when I look at your career mm -hmm. and even the things you said about your upbringing, you were in a foreign country for um, period. You were early, like you went to college early, mm -hmm. and you were young, right? Um, you did this music thing, mm -hmm. did independent, mm -hmm. super phone, yeah. My question when I look at your career, especially when I s said earlier on, you're like smart guy, mm -hmm. music, music guy, successful. It's hard for some people to relate just from what they see as far as the narrative, yeah. right? It just seems like this guy, especially without knowing the things about the parents and things like right. that, right? But you haven't seemed to overwork in trying to communicate mm -hmm. that you had such humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable or do you even find find comfort in being an outsider yeah absolutely i mean listen i think uh anyone that's made an incredible impact mm -hmm. on humanity has been an outsider i mean look at prince right look just, Ooh, just yeah. look, look i that mean guy. look look at the purple of it or or look at eminem or look at at wayne or look at at, at uzi now or look at young thug i mean the the folks that are having this kind of uh this kind of impact on society or the people who are brave enough to take on the messaging and take on the communication that most would be apprehensive and communicate the message mm. that most would be apprehensive to communicate. And I think now more than ever in a world where we are so connected, where we have so much access to data, where we have so much access to tools that can make us smarter about the decisions we make it's important for us as that next youthful generation i mean i i never wanted to be someone that took flight and didn't teach others how to fly and for me my life is an open book my stories are you know very very clearly can be transparently communicated yeah and um i really wish that more folks i wish more people would would have the courage and the honesty to really just say like look you know i wasn't necessarily self-made i don't think really anybody is well, self-made exactly right and i think but so what makes that just so interesting though is just because you're so transparent mm -hmm. but again the the public is so unknown and a lot <laughs> of these things that are right. occurring so i always right. wondered if you might have ever take it upon yourself to say, let me push my narrative out there mm -hmm. more because Kanye was one of the, he mentioned you as I'm mean, in the video I did right. on you, right? He mentioned you and Will I Am as far right. as people who are product focused and care enough, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. actually learned code. Mm -hmm. What a successful mm -hmm. rapper producer is going to learn code mm -hmm. to create a product? He mm -hmm. mentioned you, right? But when I look at the difference between you and Kanye, it's almost like the difference between Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. Both geniuses in their own right, mm -hmm. but Edison was a better PR mm -hmm. <laughs> person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he got yeah, he yeah. got it out there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and you being insp insp um, inspirational, you being a person of color, especially, mm -hmm. I always have wondered uh, would that ever like were you ever yeah. going to take it upon yourself to say, all right, now let me push it out here, do a movie or I don't know, just something, right. in, in, in right. any form of fashion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I think uh, I think a it's about timing, right? And b it's about impact, right? Mm -hmm. So, am I interested in this for me? Or am I interested in this in terms of how it will impact the world? And when I have interviews like this one and I, and I deal with the young team, super talented young team that we're dealing with at, at Superphone, and, and the idea is put forward that my story can be a catalyst mm. to inspiring young people to really achieve the success that I believe that this next generation is going to be able to achieve then it becomes more crystallized and more of a priority for me to actually tell that story. So yeah, I mean, oh. let's 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 if we can look into a crystal ball, is there a book on the horizon? Is there a movie on the horizon? I, I think 
I think uh, I think that uh, I think that's all. I think it's all within the realm of possibility. Dope. So I guess that leads perfectly into the last question. What would you want your legacy to be as Ryan Leslie? Sure. I mean, my legacy. I always, I I I actually just um, went to celebrate the life of a, a pretty pivotal character in my career in the music business. His name was Ed Woods. He was a music manager, attorney, music executive, author. And uh, I believe that everyone's legacy is just the culmination of how you impact people while you're alive. And every day I live my life that way. I live my life in such a way that the people around me, I want to make sure that anyone that's within the the range of my voice, mm. that I am planting seeds, that whether those seeds become fertilized at the moment I plant them or they bear fruit later on in life, I want to make sure that I'm planting the seeds that build the kind of intelligent decision making that help to accelerate success. Because I believe that when we accelerate success, we as humans, we innately want to share that success. And so I was actually just watching, a, I think I was watching, I think it was Antoine Walker I was watching, and he had made $108 million in the NBA and then, you know, filed bankruptcy. Oh, yeah, 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 I heard about that, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think he has a documentary about it. One of the one, one of the caveats that, that came from, from listening to his interview, he said, man, I wanted to share my success with my, with, with the people who came up with me. And so when I went on trips, I wanted everybody to go on trips. And so what I'm interested in doing is, it is changing that just a little bit so that everyone in the crew is successful in their own right. So I don't have to pay for everyone, they can pay for themselves. If I say, hey, let's go, you know, take two weeks in the south of France and get a yacht in Sardinia and, you know, just enjoy the sun and, and think about what our next idea is gonna be, it's totally different when people can come to the table with the kind of success that's equal because we can elevate each other. And I'm interested mm -hmm. in, uh, from a diversity standpoint, from a youth perspective, I'm interested in just being as inspirational uh, as possible. And not just inspirational in terms of talk, but inspirational in terms of delivering the world a utility that they can actually use, a tool that can actually give them the insights and be a compass for them so they can achieve success uh, in whatever Dope. way that success means to them. Wow. Dope, man. That was a very elegant answer. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I you, appreciate bud. you once again. Appreciate you, man. Guys, man, I yeah. hope you really benefited from the, this interview with Ryan Leslie. The yeah. guy has so many gems that he dropped throughout this. We're definitely going to have to talk about this in the comment section. You already know. Sure. Um, hey, you guys follow Ryan Leslie at where do you want to text ryan.com just leave me your number See, you can, i mean you I'm, can follow me if you'd like but text ryan.com i know a lot of folks might have some questions based on this interview so just shoot me a, just just leave me your number at text ryan.com and i'll shoot dope. you back a text and yeah we'll I, i'm interested in seeing the kind of success that is achieved after uh <laughs> a, after this point in your life dope all right i'm back and i hope you guys got as much value out of that interview as i did it was very interesting to see how ryan went from being a producer in his room thinking it was all about being the best producer in the world and then all of a sudden had that light switch that said hey i need to start getting people to know me i need to start networking i hope you guys have taken notes let me know what you guys think in the comments below and of course hit ryan up he said hit him up you have his number Text Ryan, let him know what you thought about the interview at the very least. And as always, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.